Okay, I think folks are starting to uh, filter in. You're not by yourself, are you? Okay. All right. All right, well, I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and get started um, uh, with our Sunday School class today. So first of all, welcome to Sunday School, uh, to our class, Turned Upside Down, Story of the Reformations. Um, as you might have heard, I don't know what you heard in alternative, but in traditional, Jeff uh, mentioned that we were going to be doing this class, and part of it is, of course, to engage the heritage of uh, Protestantism, certainly that wing that we our church comes from. But I hope that, uh, as you learned last week, as I sketched out, this was a period of uh, profound tumult, um, and uh, given the fact that we've been living through, you know, really interesting times over the last few years, I think there's a lot of resonance uh, for us. Uh, in addition, of course, uh, also is the fact that um, uh, uh, one of the big questions wrestled with during the Reformation period is also a question that we're wrestling with here in our community about, and that is, what does it mean to be church uh, in a new situation? What does that look like exactly? So uh, anyway, my name is Christian Collins Wynn. I'm the uh, teaching minister and uh, super happy to have you here for our second session together. Let me say a quick prayer and then we will jump in and get started. All right, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for uh, this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather, to worship, to fellowship, uh, to learn, uh, to see one another's faces, to be encouraged in the various ways that that happens. We ask and pray now that you be with us as we learn from those who come from before us and uh, look into our own future as much as try to understand our past. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so uh, before I jump in to kind of our uh, story, kind of pick up the narrative where we left off last week, I did want to let you know that there were some resources that I uh, picked out um, at the kind of, uh, I guess it was sort of late summer, to um, complement uh, this class. So these are entirely um, optional. If this is something that you're interested in, I do uh, encourage you to check it out. Uh, one of those resources is available. I think it's for 10 or $15. Um, uh, it's this little book, The Reformation by Peter Marshall, a very short introduction. And uh, these books, a very short introduction books, uh, there's, I don't know, almost 200 of them now. Uh, this is a great little overview. So you get little chapters on Luther, little chapters on the Catholic Reformation, the Swiss Reformation, etc. And as you remember, I talked about the fact that there are many Reformations, many Reformation visions, really, that populate this time. And so part of the conflict is, well, what exactly should reform look like? And so this would be a nice little guidebook. Um, if that's something that you want more in, more information on, and I'll be happy to kind of pass these through, and you can kind of thumb through them as you as you're interested. Uh, the second book is <clears throat> one of the darker histories, we might say, chapters in the Reformation uh, period was um, the treatment of Jews in particular, um, and. The rise, and of course, this is a time period before the biological category of race was invented, but that does not mean that there was not significant persecution um, of Jews. And so there's a, I'm going to have an entire lecture that talks about this, what I call theological racism, which is predominantly, uh, at this point in time at least, an anti-Jewish phenomenon. But this little book, and there's a couple of books out now uh, by Lutheran scholars uh, where they're trying to take um, that, that history more seriously, uh, to grapple with it. Um, not in order to repudiate their Lutheranism, but simply to grapple with the bad things as well as the good. So this is called Martin Luther's Anti-Semitism Against His Better Judgment. Uh, and this is uh, by Eric Gritch, and you can kind of hear in the title, there might be a little bit of an attempt to defend Luther. Um, I'm not necessarily going to try to do that in my lecture, but I'll, I'll highlight for you what's there. We don't have copies of this. If you are interested in copies of this, I'm happy to find a way to procure some at kind of our typical rate of, you know, somewhere between $15 and $20, I'm hoping. So that's another option as well. Feel free to take a look at that. 
And then the last one is a novel. So these are the ones that I've passed out before. These are obviously nonfiction. Um, this is a novel written by a friend of mine, um, uh, emeritus professor at Elon University, uh, Jeff Pugh. I know Jeff through Bonhoeffer circles. He's a Bonhoeffer scholar. Uh, we both share the same alma mater. Um, although he's an emeritus, which means he's a little bit older than I am. He's one of the only people at Drew whose dissertation I bothered to read as I was working on my own. Um, so anyway, he's a very winning person, just his personality, his way of being. And he, when he was in graduate school and he was taking classes in the history of Christianity, um, he stumbled upon an episode that I'm going to share with you uh, at some point in our time over the, you know, the weeks that we study the Reformation, which is the rebellion at Munster. And this is, uh, <laughs> I like to say, I, I kind of characterize it to one person, you know, they they started out, you know, they abolished private property, then they abolished marriage, and then by the end of it, they were eating one another. And that's sort of the, uh, that's the story. So this is an interesting book. It's called Cages, A Tale of Re Insurrection. And so it's, in some ways, it sort of looks at the dark side of religion and religious passion. And one of the reasons why I wanted to highlight this, we do have two copies of this available. These are a little bit more pricey. I think it's $30. Um, but uh, I am very interested in having Jeff maybe come in and talk to us via Zoom. So we can kind of one, one time, maybe maybe sometime in, in January, we'll do a Sunday, uh, and we'll have Jeff as sort of a guest speaker. So uh, if you are interested, please check out, go get a copy, let me know if you, if that's, you know, if you want to order something or whatever. Uh, also, just because it gives me a sense about who's using these. Is it relevant for us to continue to, you know, buy books if, if folks are not as interested in the ones that we're picking out? All right, so I'll pass that around as well. Um, okay, so let's get started together. <clears throat> um, I want to start, let's see here, with just a quick recap. So this is week two. Um, in our story on the Reformations, what did we talk a little bit about last week? And then I'm going to jump in. We have three things we want to hit on uh, that we're concerned to engage this week. As usual, I encourage uh, questions, you know, objections, whatever you want, uh, you know, whatever comes into mind. I think, I think some of the best stuff happens in those sort of uh, in the break kind of moments when we're improvising as opposed to sort of sticking with the uh, the script. So there were three things I tried to hit on uh, last week, and our, our main goal really was to talk about what I call the late medieval era. And I, I made an argument for you to you that there were two reasons I thought it was important for us to talk about the late medieval era. Number one is because it is the immediate background of the Reformation's period that we're going to wind up talking about. And secondly, because many of the dynamics um, that we find in the late medieval era are also still very much at play as we move into the Reformation's period. There's a long uh, history of scholarship, of debate about is Luther the first modern figure or is he, a, 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 is he still a medieval figure? And I personally think he's still more of a medieval monk in many ways, that it takes a little while before we get into something that looks a little bit more modern. So I think, I would say that in some sense, the late medieval era is both background but also foreground um, for understanding what's actually happening. And there were three things that I tried to highlight that I thought were particularly important for us to understand. Well, the first is that calls for reform of the church precede Luther by at least 400 years if not 500 years. Um, I talked about the fact that this, uh, you can find it, you know, coming out of circles of power. Uh, like it's, not, it's not primarily outsiders, uh, at least initially, who are calling for reform. It's actually popes and cardinals, um, as well as outsiders. But that means, and I think this is particularly important for us in our setting, that Protestants don't invent reform. That this is actually a deeply Catholic concern uh, that precedes Luther uh, by quite a number of years. Um, and 
because everyone is calling for reform, um, it's not going to surprise us necessarily that we're going to meet different visions of reform, which is why this, why I keep using reformations as opposed to reformation, because with all those different calls of re for reform, there are different visions of what reform should look like. And so in some ways, this is an era of competing visions of reform. How, how should we reform the church? Um, is the problem in the life of the church just corruption? Or is it also doctrine? Or is it the sort of weird relationship that the church has developed with political power? Or is it all those things, right? Those are all on the table, and different people will have different answers to those different kinds of questions. Uh, we went through, and I highlighted for you five big questions, and I tried to pose those five questions in a way that sounded um, almost perennial. And what I mean by that is that these are questions that sound like they're relevant today, just like they were relevant back then. What's the relationship between faith and politics? Right? I just mentioned that a second ago. What's the relationship between my belief and my action? How, how and where do I gain connection with God? Like these are all kind of relevant questions. So we, we, I went through those questions, and then I gave you sort of the iterations of the, what that would actually look like in the medieval period. So you got a sense of what those questions look like. So long-standing calls for reform, big questions. That was one big area. The second thing we looked at was sort of the structure, we might say, of late medieval society. Um, and I talked here in particular about the social structure as well as the structure of the institution of the church. And we have to, of course, talk about the church in that way uh, because, number one, it's the largest bureaucracy in the world at the time. Number two, it's the oldest institution at the time. Um, and number three, of course, it owns 50% of the land. <laughs> and therefore, it touches on way more people's lives. Uh, and of course, when we start, you know, as we get into this, you'll see why there were so many complaints. Um, in some ways, right? I mean, if you if you own that much land, that means you're charging rent, and you're charging taxes, and you're charging tithes, and you're charging, charging, charging. Anyway, I'll stop. Um, and then the last thing I tried to do was really to paint for you a picture of late medieval piety and devotion to give you a sense um, that this is actually a period of intense engagement. People are really interested in trying to live out their faith. And I kind of map, sort of gave you, uh, you know, little anecdotes here and there. But this is a time where we see enormous amounts of money being donated to churches to build um, statuary, uh, to endow uh, masses for the dead. Um, there are groups of people that are investing money in lay, lay preachers very famous, good communicators that would go on preaching tours, and they would not be preaching in Latin. They would be preaching in the local vernacular so that people can understand. I talked about the production of Books of Hours. A Book of Hours was basically a lay devotional, um, uh, not pamphlet, but I mean, I suppose we might call it a lay devotional text that was structured around the hours of prayer but it's specifically made for lay people, especially those, of course, who can read, to utilize it. And these are quite remarkable. I talked a little bit about mysticism, the late medieval mystics. One of the things that make, makes late medieval mysticism different from earlier medieval mysticism is that the late medieval mystics are writing in the vernacular and writing with the assumption that the average lay person can also be a mystic can have this experience. They don't have to become a monk or a nun. The one thing I didn't talk about that I, I think is still germane, and I want to just kind of offer this to you before we then turn to today, is um, what were called confraternities. Um, and lay, I'm trying to think of a, for want of a better term, basically lay communities of people who devote themselves without becoming priests or nuns, they will nevertheless take vows with one another, typically to hold their property in common, but also to commit themselves to prayer and other forms of devotion. 
And, uh, and un much of this occurs under the umbrella of what comes to be called the Devotio Moderna, the modern devotion. And I did talk briefly about one of the most important texts produced by that movement, which was called Thomas, Thomas Akempis's The Imitation of Christ. All right, so what's, why all that information, that fire hose of information, was really to give you a sense that, like, um, yes, there are serious problems in the church. There are major things that have to be critiqued and changed, but there is also a deep, deep hunger that people have. People are not, quote, unquote, lax or ignorant. They are interested, essentially, uh, in, in, in these questions. At least that's what, and if there's any truth in this, what people spend their money on typically indicate, has some indication about what's actually important to them. All right, so today what I want to do is to hit three items. We'll see if we can pull this off. We had to start a little bit late because church got out a little bit late. But I want to basically talk about um, two additional components of the late medieval period. And then the third thing I'm going to do is introduce you to young man Luther. And then we will come back next week and I will give you sort of the big Luther's theological sort of discoveries and kind of the, the meat, in a sense, of his reforming vision. The first thing I'm going to talk about are what, are, what, what we might call um, a series of crises that strike this period and that then help us to understand the sense of social unrest that we find and the willingness um, of interested lay people not simply to be concerned or interested, but actually to be critical of those who are in charge, uh, the kind of uncertainty of that. And then the second thing from the late medieval period that I'm going to talk about is um, sort of uh, important precursors to Luther in terms of reforming. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about a couple of reforming movements, and then we'll talk a little bit about the, re the Renaissance and, and the important contributions that it makes. All right, <clears throat> so... Let's get started. So, okay, so our late medieval crises. So I basically have four big crises that you can kind of um, discern. You know, it has touch points pretty much throughout uh, Europe in different kinds of ways uh, with different uh, types of results. One of the reasons why I think it's important to wrestle with this question is uh, last time we met together, uh, someone, I think it was uh, Jean, I don't, she's not here today, but I think she had made a comment that uh, Luther was so concerned, where do I find God, that he had, you know, digestive problems. Remember we talked about that, he was constipated, <laughs> uh, which is true. <laughs> and there are many other wonderful stories about Luther that I'll share as they're appropriate. Well, Luther has this really significant question, like, right? where do I find a gracious and merciful God? That is typically the way that Luther is described, and I think that's a truthful description. But it's a weird description if what I told you last week is also true, which is that for most folks in the late medieval period, certainly in the medieval period and entering into this time, they have a sense that God actually is present everywhere. Right? I talked to you a little bit about this idea of the sacramental worldview, right? And, yeah, the sacramental worldview believed that the world was structured in an orderly way and that, and that that structure was there for our good and that in and through that structure, we could come to know God in certain kinds of ways, Obviously, the role of the church in the sacramental system was what really opened that up, but the structuring of the world. And by structuring here, I'm not just talking about the elements of nature. So we're not just talking about, you know, that, that atoms cohere and all that kind of stuff, or that the moon is only so far from the earth, and so we have waves. Yes, of course, that's true. But we're talking also about a general belief that actually the hierarchical structure that pertained in society was not simply a human invention, that somehow God had underwritten that, and, um, and that the underwriting of that was for our good. So you can imagine 
as that structure begins to fall apart, you start to get then the background for the question of Luther, where can I find a, a gracious God? Because all the things that I thought were reliable are not really that reliable, or their reliability is questionable. Um, so this is a period then, the late medieval crisis, is a period of, we might say, coming apart. Uh, so if we were kind of earlier in the history, might, we might have talked about a knitting together and a coming together. This is the time when it begins to come apart. And eventually it gives birth to the modern world, to modernity or the modern era, um, typically is understood to come out. And, and this is, these are crises that will touch on the social, political, ecclesial, and theological structures that we might want to say, we, we could say for want of a better term, we're taken for granted, right? And I don't think this is as much of a stretch for you guys to understand that you live in a time when certain things that you thought were taken for granted have been called into question and you need to rethink them. Some of them you need to change. Some of them you may not. I don't know. I'm not going to get into that with you. Um, but you understand. Well, this is, on, this is that like magnified by 10 million Okay, and imagine that without the internet, right? No social networking, and it still managed to screw everybody up. Um, so, so significant was this period. There's a famous historian that you may have heard of, Barbara Tuckman. She's written many uh, really interesting books. Probably one of the most well-known is a book she wrote on World War One. Well, she also wrote a book on this period called A Distant Mirror, and she says this period was actually more tumultuous than the 20th century. And this is someone, right, who's writing, you know, kind of late 20th century, understands First World War, Great Depression, Second World War, Holocaust, Cold War. Really, there's a time more tumultuous than that? She's kind of arguing, yes. And this is that time. All right. So what are, the, where, what are these crises? The first one is in the political realm. I'm going to try not to spend too much time getting bogged down in details, but I just wanted to give you a sense that there are a series of crises that happen in what we might describe as the political realm that call into question certain assumptions. The first of these is what's known as the Hundred Years' War. And this is a war between England and France, uh, from 1337 to 1453. And um, it really is, in the history of Europe, very significant because this is a period in which we have the first ever standing armies. We all kind of live with a standing army, but back then, if you were going to go to fight against someone, you had to, like, go out and raise an army because people weren't kind of at the ready to fight. Well, the problem with standing armies... They might be good for some things, but the problem is that they require an awful lot to feed them, right? And they can be profound sources of disease. So famine and disease through standing armies is a, a significant thing. So we have our first standing armies, which is a little also troubling in some sense because Christendom, this word Christendom, which is supposed to be kind of Europe, overseen in some sense by the Pope, is supposed to be marked by peace. And here we have two of the great powers not at peace with one another. In fact, fighting one another for over, it's called a hundred years war, and obviously the dates, as you can see, goes beyond that. Um, during this time, and I'll come back to this in a moment, during this time, the Pope has also been moved, the papacy has been moved from Rome to southern France, and throughout the conflict between the French and the English, the papacy is constantly trying to maneuver to gain the upper hand. So the corruption of the papacy, it's kind of ongoing corruption, begins to be put on display in this, uh, in this event, this series of events. The next two are very, actually the next three are kind of very general and, and, and broad, so I'll skim through them. This is a time of the rise of centralized governments. One of the things I talked to you about the structure of medieval society is that there were really very few, in fact, almost no centralized governments. It was actually a series of overlapping jurisdictions, which we typically call feudalism, 
in which the, the things that linked us together was not so much law as bonds of fellowship or kinship or loyalty. Well, that is starting to break down and the rise of centralized governments are a part of that. The places where we see this happening most um, kind of effectively and speedily are in Spain, France, and England. So this is gonna produce certain pressures, pressures on the church, because the one thing the church is not interested in at this time is competition. And so a centralized government, you know, that could represent competition. Um, for instance, one, one great example is in the late uh, 13th century, so just before the beginning really of the late medieval period, which is typically in the 14th century, the Spanish uh, monarch decides that we're no longer going to conduct state business in Latin, which was the dominant language that connected all the countries and of course the real, um, I guess, caretaker of that language would have been the church. Um, no, we're gonna do it in Spanish, right? So that's a challenge, basically, in some sense, to the church's hegemony. Uh, the next thing is uh, the, the reintroduction of Roman law. So as the feudal system breaks down, we still need to find ways to organize ourselves. And so Rome, the Roman legal system becomes um, a, an entity that different rulers and monarchs are going to go back to to bring into. They're going to try to update it a little bit for, uh, for their contemporary challenges. But it's basically going to disrupt issues around property, around taxation, around security, right? How can someone be held accountable or not? Who do I really owe my rent tax to? Um, how much should I actually have to pay? Those are real live questions, right? I mean, if you have a mortgage or you pay rent now, you know. And if you didn't know who to contact, I mean, I literally got a, a letter yesterday after going through like weeks and weeks of applying for my student loan to be forgiven to have them tell me, oh, you, we can't forgive you of your student loan. And I go through the thing and they have like all the wrong dates, everything, and I wanted to like, you know, run through a wall. I, and if you think about in this world where you have one set of, this is the way things are done, and now that's changing. So you can kind of see the angst it would produce for folks. And then lastly, just general social unrest and protest, in part responding to these issues, there are numerous uprisings, particularly peasant uprisings, but sometimes those uprisings, the peasants, um, they're accompanied by nobility. The nobility uh, also wind up getting very frustrated with the rise of monarchies. And so there are, there's things called the Knights Revolt, et cetera. So there are these revolts that are essentially pushbacks uh, that we see. Some of the most important ones, the, there's a massive revolt in France in 1358, and then one that you may or may not have heard of, which is the Lollard Revolt in 1380 in England. I'm sure you heard of that one. That's right. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be on the exam. Yes. Oh, wait, wait. We do have a, a mic. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, so a series of political crises... Well, what's going on in the church? Surely the church is like holding things down, staying cool? No. Uh, no, it is not. Probably the two most important things are, I have mentioned these already for you. The first one is known as the Avignon Papacy. <clears throat> and this is from 1309 to 1377. Basically, I did give to you last week in the readings a citation from the papal bull Unum Sanctum which I believe was put out in 1302 or something like that, or 1304, I can't remember. The dating of that is very, is it 1303? Is that what it is? You said it's two, so she, uh, who's right? Okay, good, all right, one of you's right. Um, the, think about the dating of that. 1302, that bull is written, and what does that bull say? It says that the supreme authority spiritually on earth is the Pope, 
which doesn't sound surprising. But so also is the supreme temporal authority. By temporal, meaning political, is also the pope. So the king of France is like, oh, really? How many armies do you have? And he goes down and basically sacks Rome. And, um, and some of his troops make their way into the papal palace, and they beat up Boniface VIII. And he is so shocked by being beaten up that he dies a couple months later. In the wake of that, eventually, the pope decides um, we're gonna ha- we need to move from Rome. So they wind up moving from Rome up to southern France. And this is generally seen as sort of the, the French crown really exerting power over the church. Uh, so the Avignon Papacy, it comes to be known also as the Babylonian captivity of the church. This is also the time, while this is going on, <clears throat> the papal curia, or what, what essentially we might know as the cardinals, it starts to operate like a monarchical court. And if you know anything about, you know, you've watched movies, I'm sure, you know that the people that hang out in the court are not always the best people, right? They're constantly doing intrigue, and, you know, the, and that is exactly the same thing. So some of the corruption that eventually comes to be associated with the pope that particularly Luther and others are attacking, some of that develops straight out of this. This time is when that starts to take shape. Now, the Avignon Papacy ends, it does not go out in a whimper. It ends with three rival popes. And this is what's known as the Great Schism. So from 1378 to 1417, at one time or another, there are at least two rival claimants to being the Pope, to being the Bishop of Rome. And this culminates with three, three different people who argue that they are rightfully the Pope. Um, Eventually this is resolved by the calling of a council uh, in 1417. And they are the ones who say, none of you are Pope. We're going to elect someone totally different. And that's what they do. Uh, so that's what happens. That's how the great schism ends. So, but you can hear that, right? You think about yourself. If this is your, if this is the oldest, most highly developed, and of course, spiritual entity and organization, and it cannot even come close to getting its act together. Well, where, where can I find God? Like, that's a good question, right? Uh, You would see how that seed could then develop out of that. And then, of course, the last thing is just a general, what we might call, anti-clericalism. I just kind of just, you know, kind of, I don't like the local priest. You know, that's a jerk. You know, he impregnated my sister, and like, they, and then he got off scot-free. Or this other guy, he takes like 10% off the top of the ties. Like, that stuff is going on, those at least, and some of it's anecdotal, but some of it's also true, Um, that stuff is going on everywhere. And so there is a very deep sort of anti-clericalism, distrust of the priests, of the bishops, um, and even of the archbishops during this time. And definitely Luther is going to link into that. Um, And in Germany in particular, or in lands that we might say are German-speaking because Germany as a nation does not exist, there is a kind of proto-nationalist feeling which is all this money you know the pa- the priests keep taking from us they don't fuel it back into our local parish it gets sucked you can hear the siphoning they actually use this imagery there's a great sucking sound out of germany into italy that's the way they talk about it and so luther is going to really exploit that um, as just a general feeling of anger about the fact that all the popes down there are Italian. They're taking all this. You know, you guys have heard of St. Peter's Basilica, right? You know how that was built, right? By the papal indulgences that Luther specifically objected to. So the kind of opulence, you know, it's just, you know, it's too much for him. So political crisis, ecclesiastical crisis. We then have... Two additionals, 
And I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not sure if I should tell you about the first one. Because it's, it's very, very, um, we're in the weeds. Let me just put it that way. All right, so alongside of this is an intellectual crisis, and I'll just frame it this way. There's a basic sensibility, right, about the structure of the world, and in some sense about how to gain access to truth. And there's a belief that human language um, has a kind of divine imprint, that in some ways it was created by God. Um, and, and therefore, when I use the word for horse, that's not just a word that we use because over time it developed through, you know, custom and use and it was accident here and there. It's because there's something about that word that connects to the universal horse that sort of lives beyond in the realm of the transcendental. So there's this big, there's this entire sensibility about how Language is solid, and, and, and you can, if you reflect on it and you utilize it, it can actually be a pathway to God. Well, some folks come along and they say, no, language is basically human convention and invention. And I think almost all of us who are modern people, we don't tend to think about language in that way, in part because we are children of what comes to be called nominalism. Well, nominalism also has a theological expression and this theological expression is particularly associated with a man named William of Ockham and you might have heard of Ockham's razor that and this is that Ockham uh, right the simplest exp the simplest exp explanation is probably the correct one <clears throat> well that's great but he also did some other stuff um, <laughs> one of the other things that he did was he he was led in his desire to reaffirm faith as very important in knowledge and in theology, he wound up saying something like, God has two wills. And the, the one will is, is the will that we see enacted in front of us. Right? God willed that there be a world. God willed that there be a church, that there be human beings. God willed that Jesus would come and die for our sins that we would have access to that through the sacraments. That's what is sometimes called the ordained will. Then he said, but God also has another will. And that other will is the fact that God can do anything that God wants. In fact, God could do the opposite of what God did over here. Now, those two distinctions had always been around in theology. And it, and I kind of go something like this. God can do whatever God wants, but God chose to do this. Think about how that, how I said that. God can do whatever God wants, but God chose to do this. That seems to root God in what God did, right, what God chose to do. The other thing to say, the other way you could say it is, God did this, but God could do whatever God wants. Do you feel the difference of those two? The second one is more terrifying because God did this, but you know what? God could do whatever God wants, which means maybe God doesn't, maybe God's going to change God's mind. Maybe God's going to, you know. So this developed into what was known as the terrible hidden God. The God in some sense enveloped in mystery that we cannot know. We can only know the God who reveals God's self, but we cannot know the hidden God. We just know that that God is there. So how do we gain access? Like, how do we truly, in other words, come to connect with God? So this, as you could imagine, creates a profound sense of anxiety, and I would dare to argue that this is the backdrop of Luther's question. That the reason that Luther is looking for a gracious God is because he hasn't been able to free himself from this idea that, that, that God could just be arbitrary. God could just change God's mind. Right? How do we really know that God's going to be faithful is really the question. Right? And Occam says we don't. We just have to believe. Right? That creates a really profound sense of unsettling. There's also, during this time, we want to just say new knowledge. Now, some of this I've kind of, uh, you know, this is, a couple of these are much later, or at least they're at the very tail end, but the quote-unquote discovery of new lands, the new world, 
um, developments in astronomy. Um, as I mentioned here, uh, there are other maybe intellectual traditions that I'm not describing here. But what they do is they put a profound amount of pressure on the intellectual traditions and the theological traditions that had seemed to work prior to this. And yes, the average person in the field is not sitting around thinking about William Ockham. <laughs> but eventually those ideas will trickle into his life or her life because their priest might have thought about it and it might come out in a sermon. So that's, you know, sorry, so there is a kind of, yes, it doesn't immediately impact people, but eventually it kind of makes its way into their life. And then w the one additional that is profoundly disruptive, and, and here we might want to talk about sort of disruptive technology, is of course the invention of the printing press. It's invented in 1455. Um, I believe, Dick, you talked about having sailed past the city, right, where it was first invented. Is that what was the name of it? No, Mainz. Mainz, yes. Um, this means that more and more materials can get into people's hands. Some of those materials, maybe they shouldn't be in people's hands. Of course, the church eventually is going to respond to that. So uh, this is another crisis, right, an information crisis in some ways. And then lastly is the social crisis. Uh, and it really, the social crisis really boils down to one thing and the response to it, and that is the Black Death. Right, the Black Death, which is the Black Plague, uh, which happens 1347, 1350, if we're talking specifically about Europe. Um, in some areas, 50 to 60 percent of the population is killed. Entire towns are wiped out, whole families. Um, and if a town, a town is not just where people live, it's also where traditions live in those people's memories. It's where knowledge, how to do woodworking, how to do you know this, how to do that, that's lost. So the, think about the profound disruption of that. It also, of course, means there are fewer people to work. And if there are fewer people to work, well, you would think that they could charge more. But no, 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 no. I've given to you a citation, actually, given to you two citations. One of them is a description by Boccaccio of the Black Death. And the second one is an ordinance issued in England saying that people are not allowed to charge a higher price to do the same job they once did uh, before, even though their skills are on much higher demand. So like, there's no kind of market uh, element here. It's just highly controlled. Well, these are the kind of things then that fuel something, you know, things called peasants' revolts, right? I should be able, because I'm more in demand, to use my skills and, and have people pay for them. Uh, but they decide not to. So all of that taken together, you don't, again, need all the details, but you have a sense of profound crisis that shapes this time. Uh, let me stop for just one minute and see, I've got a question over here. Um, Rick, would you mind taking a couple questions in different places? <clears throat> Actually, not loud enough. No, 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 we want this online. It, it needs to be online, thank you. Yeah, I need to hold you accountable by putting it online. Anyway, is there any difference when you think of today's world, if you've ever lived in Chicago or Eastern cities, there's something what they call graft. And that's kind of kickbacks and cost overruns and lining crooked politicians' pockets with all these excess boondoggles. And it's starting to happen up here with light, light rail and some of these things. They're finding out it's like the Chicago syndicate of graft. And was this kind of a church version of graft where people felt they couldn't control it? They just had to live with it because people in Chicago just accept it. We're up here, we're a little more adverse because we used to be kind of more, you know, pure as driven snow, no pun intended. No, yes, maybe. <laughs> I mean, y you know, corruption is uh, endemic and it's a part of this story as well. 
And so there would definitely be touch points. It would, of course, also be different. So that would be the, the no. So yeah, I could certainly see connections there as well. Was there a comment over here as well? Thank you for that. Uh, my comment regards, um, it's regarding to William of Ockham. Where was the gospel of Jesus Christ going during this time period? Did they, did the church and the people, uh, let's call them underlings, because I don't know, the uneducated, was the gospel still being proclaimed or was the church proclaiming the hierarchy of the church and their rules? It really depends, I suppose, on your perspective. I think um, one of the things I tried to, when I was doing, when I was painting the picture last week, was to give you a sense that, that there is intense concern and lay devotion. And, and so people are coming in and preaching very powerful sermons. Um, and, of course, this is also the time of St. Francis and, you know, figures like that. So it's not like the gospel has somehow disappeared. At the same time, though, there are working assumptions like, and I think one of the most significant ones is that the church, whatever the church is, it probably needs to be identified with the bureaucracy and the hierarchy as opposed to the people, right? And that's something, of course, that has to be critiqued. Um, and again, just to reiterate, we are talking about late medieval Catholicism. We are not talking about contemporary Roman Catholic thought. They've, they have changed as well in, in many different ways. So it's yes and no in some ways, probably. All right, great questions. Okay, so let me move us then into our second kind of big thing. Um, and we'll do our best to get, our, to get to our third. I'm glad I was only going to introduce you to, to Luther today. Um, our second really big area then is uh, this idea, <clears throat> and I mentioned this uh, before last week when I was trying to make the point about the fact that Protestants don't invent reform. Um, that there are a series of kind of forerunners, whether they be figures or movements, uh, that are important. And I'm just going to, I'm going to kind of run through that, and then I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about the Renaissance because of the singular con contribution there of Erasmus. So there really are kind of three things I want to mention to you in terms of pre-Reformation reforming type folks. The first is a man named John Wycliffe. Wycliffe is writing in the 14th century. Um, he is an Oxford educated and Oxford prof figure. Um, he is one who pushes back against papal claims to supremacy in argument that the Pope is not and should not be seen as a supreme in matters of faith and life. Rather, scripture should be seen as supreme. Now, of course, the question is, who's going to interpret scripture? But that's a question that has to be answered down the road. Um, so sole authority um, uh, is scripture. Uh, Wycliffe also is making this argument. He makes a couple of other interesting arguments that prefigure Luther. But one of the clear um, dynamics here is Wycliffe is aligned with the king of England, who's also trying to you know, get the Pope out of England. So it's very useful to have a theological voice when you're trying to do that. The second um, movement is one that I talked about last time, and this is what's known as the conciliarist movement. And basically it's the, the notion that authority in the church should not reside in a single figure, the Pope, but rather in a council Right? And so if you're familiar with the history of the church, you might know that early in the life of the church, a series of councils are called. Um, uh, four typically are those recognized by Protestants. And these are um, places where folks from all over the known world at the time come and they speak on behalf of their community and they speak into the process that is supposedly unfolding. So the idea is, we need to, if we're going to see reform happen, we need to recover this. We need to recover a conciliatory or a, cons a conciliarist vision. And they do. They wind up actually uh, having some effect. Uh, the first major uh, event, of course, is the calling of uh, the council at Constance in 1417, which ends the Great Schism. And that feels like a real victory. <laughs> 
because the only way we could get rid of these three rival claimants to being pope is everyone had to weigh in on it. Well, they then sort of become victims of their own success, and they establish another council called the Council, the Great Council of Basel. And that council, as you can see, lasts for a while. It goes on for four years, and the deliberations are so slow that it winds up turning off a lot of people. And they decide, you know, we really probably should just have one person making decisions or one person in consultation. So conciliarism, though, is there in the background. And then lastly is another figure named Jan Hus. <clears throat> Jan Hus was um, familiar with the writings of John Wycliffe. Uh, he was based in the city of Prague. And uh, he also, as you can see, made arguments around scripture being superior to the pope or tradition. He eventually, however, is arrested and put to death by one of the other reforming movements. So this is a great foreshadowing, actually, of what's going to happen when we get into the Reformations as Lutherans start to kill Calvinists, who start to kill Anabaptists, who get killed by Roman Catholics. Who, you know. So all these different reforming visions are not necessarily capacious. You know, They're not arguing for religious toleration at this point in time. Uh, in, in the least. So, but this is a good kind of foreshadow. All right, so alongside then this is a, a broader movement known as the Renaissance. All right, and the Renaissance, this is a word that uh, uh, means rebirth. Uh, there are other Renaissance um, that happen prior to the one that I'm talking about now, the one that we usually think of is the Italian or Dutch Renaissance, which is going on in the 14th, excuse me, the 15th and 16th centuries, so the 1400s and 1500s. There are other Renaissance. The most probably important one is one that was associated with Charlemagne. Uh, so it's not the first time. But it's typically a, a, a movement among intellectuals, artists, um, the educated, folks who would have some access and facility with writing. Uh, and, and they wind up producing um, a, a very important, um, what we might call, posture. Most people who are in any way, shape, or form champions of the Renaissance are, are deeply disgusted with the state of the church and with the state of public morality. And their belief is that if we can recover the ancient authors, like Cicero or Virgil or others, then we can re-inject their vision of virtue into our society. So we want to recover their, the, their emphasis on virtue, how they understand virtue, through the study of the humanities. And this is what humanism here means. Um, the studia humanitatis, which is the study of poetry, rhetoric, history, and especially classical Latin. The great rallying cry is ad fontes, back to the sources. That's the idea, back to the sources. Now, this is made possible because the Turks uh, have sacked Constantinople, and when they do that, Enormous numbers of scholars who actually know how to read Greek and classical Latin flee and they move west and they take with them texts, etc. So all these texts are being reintroduced and then there had also been texts being reintroduced through the Islamic presence in southern Spain and in Sicily. So we have these sources now that we can go back to and read. Uh, let's do that. As we do that, um, we will learn ourselves how to envision and inhabit their vision of virtue. Um, humanism then takes on a particular hue um, in what is sometimes known as Christian humanism. So humanism writ large is the study of these ancient authors in concern with virtue. Christian humanism is applying the methods of reading specifically to scripture and to the church fathers. Right? So what is that going to mean? It's going to mean we're going to read these texts no longer 
with the mountains and mountains of tradition and interpretation that typically we would have to read to get out whatever, the, whatever this passage means. We're going to move all that out of the way, and we're just going to try to understand this historically and in its own context, which is a huge change. We're not going to be primarily thinking about, well, what did Aquinas think about John 3.16? We're going to be trying to think about what did John and John's audience think about John 3.16? Right? That's a different thing. And we're going to do that with better texts because all of a sudden we have all these new manuscripts coming in. And no longer are we going to be reliant only on the Latin Vulgate. We now have access to much, much better Greek manuscripts and Hebrew manuscripts, which give us an even closer. So one of the most famous changes or an example that's typically used here um, uh, and this is typically called sacred philology. So the philology is the study of words. Um, one of the great examples is there's a change, uh, and I'm try oh, I should have written it down in my, my outline, but basically there's a place in scripture that the Latin had translated do penance. And once you actually look at it, you look at, you know, you look at the Greek, et cetera, you find it's not do penance, it's simply repent. And that's, that's a different meaning, but it's especially a different meaning if you have an entire sacramental system known as the penitential system, right? Uh, so the one is a command to engage the penitential system. The other is simply a command to turn and be changed. That's the kind of changing that we're talking about. So there's this sort of uh, very important things that are going on here. So you have the publication of new editions of Old and New Testament texts based on all of these new manus manuscript discoveries and the use of philological methods. Well, no one in this story is more important than Erasmus of Rotterdam. And Erasmus is sort of just prior to Luther. Um, he is obviously of Rotterdam, so that means he's Dutch. He's from the lowlands. Um, he's born in that area. He grows up going to a school run by this group known as the Brethren of the Common Life, and the Brethren of the Common Life was one of those lay devotion groups that they just came together and committed uh, to living a life um, uh, of piety from their perspective, but not necessarily becoming monks or nuns. Um, he winds up entering into an Augustinian monastery and I like to highlight that because he's in the same monastic family that Luther is going to be in. Um, and the Augustinians were one of the Observantine traditions. And the Observantine is one of those strict traditions that was trying to recover a more rigorous devotion. So he goes there. He winds up studying in Paris. And then it's when he goes to Cambridge to study with a man named John Collette that he's really introduced to humanism for the first time and the use of these philological methods to read scripture and the church fathers, and he's hooked, right? And so by the time that Luther comes on the stage, Erasmus is already an international figure. And the reason for that is because of works that he produces leading up to that moment. The first one is known as the Encridian, or the Handbook of the Christian Soldier, and the basic argument here is the, this is an attempt to recover virtue. And most humanists, like I said before, are deeply interested in recovering virtue. They believe that that's the real solution to the problems in the social order. Luther eventually is going to break with them. And he's going to argue human beings can't be virtuous. We need something different. So that's going to be one of his uh, differences. The second is his stinging satire and praise of folly, which is a satirical attack on the corruption of the church um, that is published in 1511. And it's dedicated to his friend Thomas More, who will eventually be executed. Um, and then the last and by far the most important text uh, in terms of his contribution, not only to the Protestant Reformation, but also to the later Catholic Reformation, is he publishes in, in 1516 a new version of the Greek New Testament. 
And this will become the basis for Luther's reforming and eventually for Luther's German edition of the New Testament. He will draw from the materials that he finds here. Um, one of the things that he does is he actually publishes the first version. He publishes, uh, I believe this is how it's set up, but it's something like he publishes it and you have a Greek passage. Then you have a Latin passage that is based on the Greek passage. And then you have the Vulgate. And the Vulgate cannot stand up even to the Latin that's based on the Greek translation. And so he starts to show that there are all these problems in the sacred text that has been guiding the church for over a thousand years. So this is one of the reasons why there's a lot of concern about what Mr. Erasmus is doing up in Holland. Um, yeah. Okay. Last thing I want to do then, I think we have time for this very quickly because I'm not going to do anything other than sort of give you some intro here, is introduce you to Luther. So uh, Luther... His dates you have here, 1483, 1546. This is a pretty good picture of him. I believe it's just prior to uh, when he is um, absconded uh, and that is kidnapped in 1521 um, as a monk. Uh, I have a whole spiel about why Luther's important. I'm going to skip most of that. Uh, but his importance, it's very hard to quantify. This is the kind of person that if you were reading, you know, a generic history text, here's a church history name that's going to show up because of what he winds up being responsible for. So he has world historical importance. He has modern importance. Some people argue that his, his stance against the Catholic Church is sort of the first um, example of individual conscience standing over against a, a power that's greater than them. He obviously has Germanic importance, um, and I'll go into that a little bit more. Maybe we'll talk about that sometime down the road. And then also, of course, Reformation importance. Okay, what can we say about Luther? From peasant stock, father's uh, name is Hans Luther. So Luther was actually the original spelling of his name. There's, I think, three different iterations of him changing the spelling of his name until it finally falls on Luther. Uh, and I'm talking here about Martin. Uh, his father starts out as a peasant. I think I mentioned to you last week the familiar story. He borrows money from his in-laws, and then he makes, a, you know, he makes himself. Uh, he does that primarily by becoming a silver miner. And, of course, when you get that kind of money and you're kind of raising yourself up, what do you want for your family? Well, you don't necessarily want your kids to have to go out and toil in the field. You want them to get an education. So uh, Hans and his wife uh, both really had um, dead set for Luther that he would become a lawyer. Um, and I'll talk about this in a minute. Luther appears to have had a very strained relationship with his parents, um, so much so that there's like, there are actually books on the psychology of Luther from that perspective. We can understand some of his reforming as a, you know, lashing out at his parents. He also is educated in a school run by the Brethren of the Common Life. And then in 1501, he um, enrolls at the University of Erfurt to study law. Now, there's a famous legend uh, early in Luther's life. He, the, in this le it's a legend because there's two or three different versions and actually, you can find all the different versions in Luther's own writings. So, so basically, Luther is traveling from Erfurt back to his home village. And in one of the versions, um, in all of the versions, he's in a terrible lightning storm. In one of those versions, he's with a friend. And as they're traveling, the friend gets struck by lightning. And Luther, at that moment, you know, throws himself down. And basically the idea is that something happens in a storm and it freaks Luther out so much that he promises to Jesus and to St. Anne that he will become a monk. So that is the legend uh, that somewhere around 
uh, probably 1504-ish, uh, Luther has this experience. I think more than likely there's a combination of things at play here. And, of course, in 1505, he winds up entering into the monastery and becoming a monk. Number one is something must have terrified Luther on that road. Yes. Number two is that what we know of Luther is that he was very, very concerned with his salvation. He was a very, very, like, religiously conscientious person, perhaps even too high strung in that area. So you could see, though, that pushing him. And number three, what is the best way to thwart your parents who want you to become a lawyer? To become a monk. I mean, so I think all three of those are at play in 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 this decision uh, by Luther. So uh, I, I do think there's some truth to that. So Luther's a monk. So this is the very last thing I'm going to share with you. Uh, and we'll come back again next week, and I'll kind of give you his sort of Reformation discovery stuff. So his experience as a monk starts out relatively peacefully. Um, if you've ever, there's a, there's a movie uh, starring, I think, Joseph Fiennes as Luther, which is very miscast. Uh, I mean, Joseph Fiennes is a fine actor, but he just does not physically strike me as Luther. Uh, but there's a scene where um, he's gone through kind of all of the preparations, and now he has to celebrate Mass for the first time, and he literally freaks out. He spills some of the wine, right, which is the blood of Jesus. Um, and so something happens around that time where his conscience really, really goes off the rails, and he starts to become and, and have this feeling that he is truly unworthy. And that God, God's primary interest in Luther is smashing him. That's what Luther thinks. Now, how does he deal with that sense? Well, the first thing he does is he turns to the penitential system, right? The penitential system is essentially there for that reason, to help you work through your guilty conscience or if you've done something wrong, et cetera. This at least would be the assumption of a late medieval person. The problem is that Luther takes this to an extreme, and you're going to find that Luther has a very extremist personality. Um, he uh, was known to go for days without sleep because he would stay up all night praying. Um, he would uh, deny himself food, of course. Um, he went to confession almost every single day. And um, there are stories of him going to confession, confessing his sins, coming back and realizing he'd forgotten some and going back, confessing more sins, coming back and then thinking, well, maybe I'm just trying to, you know, get God to like me by confessing. So going back to confess his confession, yeah. right? And, and then, of course, flagellating himself, beating himself with, um, uh, with leather straps. So this is a part of his makeup, his personality. And one of the things that, that does stay with Luther here is his realization that he cannot get away from sin, that it is somehow baked in. Um, so for him, this is one of the reasons why the humanist message of recovering virtue, he ultimately is going to be like, that is just not enough. We need something more. And that's because he believes that the problem of sin is a genuine problem. He, he will actually say Erasmus does not take the problems of sin seriously enough. The, the next thing that happens is uh, Luther winds up with um, a very important sort of confessor, uncle kind of figure. He's basically his spiritual advisor, Johann von Staupitz. Um, he is uh, his mentor as well as the vicar general of the Augustinian um, friars in Germany. So a pretty important figure um, within the monastic community of which Luther's a part. Well, Staupitz um, really takes a shine to Luther because among because within all of this intensity is also a very fierce intellect and a genuine concern. And Staupitz is like, you know, he take, kind of takes him under his wing and he says, what I want you to do first is I want you, in order to find freedom from this, I want you to read the mystics. So, so he turns, you know, essentially from using the penitential system to starting to read the medieval mystics. People like Johann Thaler, and the, the Theologica Germanica. And eventually, or at least initially, he's freed 
because the overriding argument and message of the mystics is love. That love of God and love of neighbor is where you will find true freedom. And so he initially is really caught with this vision. The call is truly to love God. The problem, though, is that it doesn't work over time. And this is where I think that Occam, hidden God, comes back in. Because there's a place where Luther actually writes, I think it's in the preface to his Latin, the Latin edition of his works. He says, I tried to love God, but I couldn't love him. I hated him. I hated that vision of God. Couldn't stand him. I just feel so sorry for him. So the hidden God terrifies him so much that he responds by hating that God. And, of course, the beauty is that that's not God. That's just one image of God. All right. So what, what does Staupitz do? He's like, okay, that, that kind of worked, but then didn't work. He went off the rails. So you know what? You're going to study the Bible. <laughs> that's what he tells him. So uh, he sees that Luther is, uh, has this fierce intellect, as I said before. He's a, he has a way with words, as, as you'll discover. And they decide that he is going to go and get a doctorate, a degree in the study of Scripture. And that's what he does. Uh, so he begins this process. As I say, he receives his doctorate in theology. And theology basically means commentary on Scripture at this time. So Luther is effectively, if you looked at his body of work, he would be an Old Testament professor. That's the area where he really focuses, though most of his discoveries happen with the New Testament. He then will move in 1513 to the town of Wittenberg, and remember, it's only about 5,000 people. There's a new university that's been founded there. And um, uh, the, I think it's Philip of Hesse, um, takes a shine to him and really likes, you know, that this is my new shiny professor that I'm going to have in this new great university. So that's where we're going to stop our story today. Yeah, I'm going to keep you, I want you to come back. Because now... You're literally we're on the cusp of what Tim t comes to be called the Reformation discovery. Uh, so I hope that that gave you uh, a lot to chew on. So we went over the medieval crises. We talked about the Renaissance. Uh, I think we spent more time on that, but also some other early reformist movements. And then we got a chance to hear about Luther's early life. Uh, and his kind of the struggles, really, in some ways. So this is a deeply personal thing for him. And, and, and I think it's important for us to remember that, not to lose it or to overemphasize it. But once you get into the Reformations, you see how huge it is, how social and political and everything else it is. And to think that, at least for Luther, it really starts as a kind of personal struggle as opposed to some big other big question. And I think that's important to keep in mind. I've got, uh, there's, uh, obviously if you need to go, you can feel free to leave. I've got a couple minutes that I'll open up for questions. Rick's got the, we have a question over here. What's the Vulgate? <laughs> So the Vulgate was the Latin translation done in the 5th century by Jerome. And it, is, it becomes sort of the standard text in the Western Christian world. It's called Vulgate because the form of Latin that he uses is the vulgar tongue. So it's not high classical Latin. It's kind of common Latin. And so that's, yeah, that's basically what it is. So it is your sacred text at that time. Other right over here, Jeff. Uh, from all of this, I mean, I get the impression, you know, Luther's just a guy, kind of a little not nothing guy studying along, and he transforms. Protestant, established Protestant. Are you going to talk about how he became so prominent next week or the week after? So yeah. how he moved from nothingness to... Yes. Okay. Yep. But you got to come back. <laughs>
<laughs> oh yeah. Oh, what? Of course. Rick, this is a legitimate question. You you discussed humanism, uh, which in the book I was. Thank you for clarifying. Um, I'm wondering uh, how that kind of got lost over the time since the Roman Empire in turn, for example, you have Stoicism, et cetera. But it seems like it So it gets lost and comes back and yeah. what happens? Yeah. Well, basically what happens is the ability to read classical Latin deteriorates uh, starting in the 6th and 7th century in the western half of the Roman Empire. Uh, and that's partly because of Germanic tribal invasions um, it's also the loss of actual texts. Um, those texts don't disappear, disappear, but they go to other places. And so one of the great and really interesting stories of, is the recovery of Greek and Latin texts by Islamic scholars out of uh, the University of Baghdad and the reintroduction of those texts through Spain and southern Sicily, and then what you, you've got those coming in, but it's really when Constantinople, I think it's in 1453, is sacked. Enormous, you know, and before that, you had people fleeing. Well, that's, again, it, it's not just people. It's, you know, it's people with skills and abilities and et cetera, and so it's that reinfusion, those double pathways that really uh, makes possible something like the Renaissance. More comment up here? You mentioned that uh, Wycliffe, um, I, I, talk, I thought I heard you say was allied with the English king. Um, was that intentional or was that because Wycliffe happened to be questioning the authority of the Pope, it made him a convenient person for the king to utilize? I, I would, t like, not having looked carefully in a long time, my inclination would say it's the latter. Um, the Wycliffe was not, uh, Wycliffe, Wycliffe was not a witless person in the sense that he would know that some of these arguments might be useful to the king. So I think there's probably a mixture of him making certain arguments. There's no like star chamber. There's no like um, the king, it's not like when we get into the English Reformation and the king calls together all the great luminaries in the kingdom and they create this sort of think tank and then they start producing stuff. That's not what's happening. But there is a certain sense in which I think, I do think that Wycliffe sort of, you know, he understands the political winds and he also understands his position, and so he'll articulate some things. So I think some things are probably articulated with no connection whatsoever, and they become convenient. And then other things, there may have been a more of a knowledge on Wycliffe's part that this would be convenient. You know what I mean? So I think it's kind of a mixture. And I guess more generally, and maybe you're going to talk about this as we go along, but um, the other reformers, how much were they political and how much were they just progressing, I guess, I, the sense I get is like Luther. They're all, they're all political. They're all in one, I mean, Luther himself will become political. They're, they will all in one way or another um, have to face the question of how does this reforming vision interface with the social order? Um, and so... Some will be very definitely allied with political powers. In fact, the majority in some ways, like if you looked at the, refor the reformed tradition has an element of this, Zwingli and Zurich. Luther clearly has an element of this. The English Reformation is nothing but this, you know, <laughs> and the Catholic Counter-Reformation has clear desires for that. The Anabaptist radical reformation is unique in this regard because they argue that not only do does the morals and practices of the church need to change, not only does the doctrine need to change, but the social order itself needs to be questioned. 
And so sometimes they're going to suffer rather significantly because of that. So, but the politics stuff is very much engaged. And uh, in some ways, like this early telling of the Luther story, you see the background, like he's not thinking politically, I don't think, in a sort of broad sense. It's really a personal thing. But once he gets put into this position at the University of Wittenberg, in inevitably it's going to take on that hue. And it's going to partly be thrust upon him. Like he's not necessarily, I don't think he's necessarily asking for it. But once it is thrust upon him, then he does really truly own it. You know, and so exactly where that happens, maybe 15, 21, 22, is when he really starts to lean into it. Hey, thank you all so much. You, you, you stayed after. I really appreciate it. We had a great full room today. Uh, let me just say a quick blessing. Lord, thank you so much for this day. I pray you send forth our friends, uh, those who are present and those who are online into the day, that they may know your presence and your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.